My graduate student said to me, Aaron, it's like playing whack-a-mole with these fires. You never know when they're gonna pop up. And you put one out and the next one pops up. But that's really what happened. And so with slash and burn agriculture, these fires can get out of hand. And so that's been a big problem in Indonesia. Studies have shown in these palm oil plantations that they can survive, but they don't do very well. And in many cases, they start to enter starvation mode. I think orangutans are a really interesting study species um, because they are faced with extremely challenging and unpredictable environments. So they actually serve as a really wonderful model organism when you're trying to look at how animals cope with an unpredictable and varying environment. My research um, focuses on how orangutans cope with environmental variability. And in particular, I'm interested in how they deal with low energy and high energy situations and how they modify their behavior, but also how they are physiologically adapted to a changing environment and ultimately how this influences their health. Orangutans are listed as critically endangered. They live in forested habitats. They're primarily arboreal, so they need trees to survive. So I'd say that the biggest threat that right now is the conversion of these habitats to oil palm plantations. You kind of see these huge swaths of areas that border up to a rainforest, to a tropical forest, that is completely clear cut and then just rows of oil palm planted. Orangutans are extremely affected by deforestation and human impacts because they have such a slow life history. And what that means is that they don't start reproducing until they're about 15 years old. And they only reproduce once every eight years. So the biggest threats are, are humans, obviously, and human impacts on orangutan population. In my lab, we take the urine samples that we collect in the morning from wild orangutans in Indonesia, and they get shipped over here. And then we analyze those samples for different indicators of energetic stress and energetics in general. Some of the things that we're finding is that when they're in a really nutrient-poor environment for long periods of time, this can be very detrimental if it happens for a long period of time, right? So with orangutans, what we see is they might go through one of these low periods, but we know the fruit's gonna go back up and they're gonna more than triple, say, caloric intake, and they'll be up there for a little bit and then it'll come back down again. But if we remove the trees from their environment or even you know, remove some of the trees from their environment that are important food resources, they may, may never get to that peak again. And then they're stuck down at, you know, at this plateau down here and that's when it can be really critical for them. A lot of people do ask me, what does the future look like for orangutans? You know, what can we do? You know, we're not going to Borneo or Sumatra to, to work with orangutans, but what can we do domestically? So here in, in the United States, and you know, I think the biggest thing is just being a smart consumer. You can look up our NGO, which is Core Borneo. We do a lot of work towards fire prevention, environmental education projects. And it's really through our donors that we're able to keep these projects going and help protect uh, this population of wild orangutans. Make sure when you do buy products with palm oil that 
these are companies that are part of the roundtable for sustainable palm oil and make sure that the products that you're purchasing aren't a threat to wildlife in general.